kind of getting back to the idea, we had a couple sermons regarding the family. Uh, a while back I preached, uh, I don't know how many weeks ago it was, but I preached on your family and your church. And so the idea there was uh, getting your family ready and your responsibility, particularly the men, the he heads of the household, to bring uh, your family to church and get them ready and uh, uh, you know, both spiritually and mentally and, and then uh, actually to be here. And I believe that's important, you know, just church attendance. That's like one of the most basic parts about Christianity, really, is just showing up to church where the Lord can work on you and you can grow and all that. But I want to talk to, uh, this afternoon about uh, your family and your ministry, okay? So just coming and sitting in church isn't really a ministry. I mean, I'm glad, and I'm glad anybody would come. But if you think about that, like, uh, I, I, I'll never forget, like, uh, when we worked on a bus ministry in Oklahoma City, uh, those kids that we picked up on the bus, right? We spent gas money to go out there and pick them up, to bring them. We gave them lots of candy, probably shouldn't have, but we did. And uh, uh, we sang lots of songs, you know, we lost lots of sleep. <laughs> and uh, did, out of our way, to, and, and they acted like, you know, they were benefiting us just by simply showing up. And I remember if you'd get on to them or something like that, you'd hear this sometimes like, well, I'm just not going to come anymore. And you're just like, and <laughs> like, what is that supposed to hurt my feelings or something like that? I just don't understand that mentality. Like, well, I'm just not, not going to go sit in the pew and be a number for you. <laughs> right. And so like, we always want people to come, but, uh, but there's more to being a Christian and being involved in your church than just showing up and obviously showing up is good. It's a good place to start. We're always glad to see people here for some people. That's where they are in their Christian life. Just being able to show up to church is a, is a hard deal because they got so much going on in their life and there is a balance. There's like juggling, uh, you know, of, of all these different things that you have in your life. And it's hard. It's hard. And I, I understand that. And I'll talk about that in a little more detail. But I want to talk about the family, uh, your family and your ministry. And if you didn't pick it out, uh, I've talked to you about this passage before. One of my favorite verses, kind of my ministry verse is there in verse 15. I beseech you, brethren. You know the house of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. I love reading, as, just as I read this, I love reading Paul, you know, about the life of Paul and how just dedicated he was, hardworking. Seems like the guy had no patience for the ones that didn't want to work. You know what I mean? That's that split off that he had with Barnabas. Because he, John, he wanted, Barnabas wanted to take John Mark, and he's like, nope, he failed us once before. He's going to slow us down. And, and it wasn't like no Christian left behind. <laughs> it was like, hey, if you're not keeping up, you're, you know, we're leaving you in the dust. And uh, Paul was like that. He was a great guy, loving guy. He loved people, but he wanted to get the job done. You know, I'm, I'm a little more laid back than him. For those who, who wish I was more like Paul, sorry, but, <laughs> but I do. It is inspiring to read that and see Paul's just like, go, go, go. He accomplished a lot. In, uh, in the time that he had. And I think that's part of it. He felt like he wasted so much of his life going against Christ that he felt like, I don't know how much longer I have to live, but I need to give, give everything. And I've met people like that. I remember when Miss Sally came uh, to our church there in Iola. She's 80, she was 81 years old when she first came. And uh, several times we heard her say, I wasted so much of my life. And I don't know how many more years I have, but I just want to give everything that I have to the Lord. And that's, that's sometimes the mentality that we have to have. If we were raised in church, it gets easy to feel like, ah, we got plenty of time. So what about the idea of including your family in your ministry? Uh, of course, a lot of times you hear the word ministry. Me, growing up in church, a lot of times when they said in the ministry, they were referring to the pastor, you know, or maybe a full-time missionary or something like that. And it was almost like that old mentality of having like the, the, the clergy and the lay people, right? Yeah, the, you got these people are in the ministry and everybody else just kind of shows up to get the blessing or whatever. No, that's not how we work in an independent Baptist church. Uh, we are all this on the same on the same playing field, uh, just we have different positions, different roles. And so uh, uh, this is uh, what I want to talk about. So my ministry, though, is obviously I'm a pastor, and so there are certain responsibilities and, and uh, a job that I have to do. Now, I am in a position unlike anybody else in this church or in Iola, where I actually have a paid position. This is my job. And so everybody else that works is on a volunteer, volunteer uh, basis. But don't get me wrong. I've, uh, 
I've put in my time, so to speak. I know what it's like to work two jobs and go to college and be raising kids and, and, uh, and have to work as much as I can in the church and be in the bus ministry and be in the choir and be in, you know, teaching Sunday school classes and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it is hard. I understand that. But uh, what we do for the Lord is really more important, is, is, is the most important. Now, now, we have to be loyal to our job. We have to fulfill our responsibilities at work. Don't ever think that I'm telling anybody, oh, who cares? It's just a job. You can get another job. You need to go to church. Uh, you know, I understand there's times you have to be there for work. There's times they require something of you. Uh, don't ever think that I'm, I'm minimizing that. Okay, but if you think about on a scale of all the things in, tr in the world that are most important, our relationship with the Lord is most important. And the things, you know, exercising ourselves unto godliness, 1 Timothy 4, those are the things that are going to last forever, you know. And, uh, and so we have to keep that in the mindset. Everything else we do is out of necessity, but we're trying to find what can we do for the Lord. And, and really, a Christian has to, has to think that way and uh, get into a position that they can do as much for the Lord as they can. Here's what I found in my life. We do find time to do what we want to do. You ever notice that? <laughs> we do find time to do what we want to do. And I mean, you can look at my schedule and people are like, oh, yeah, how do you do it? You're so busy. You go there and you go there. Well, look, I still squeeze in opportunities to do what I want to do. And, uh, and probably sometimes more important things suffer as a result of it. But that's just the reality. What we want to do, we find time to do. And so if you want to serve the Lord, you're going to find time to do it. And if you're praying and asking God to help you with opportunities to serve, He's going to do it. And he's going to free up time for you and you're going to find opportunities to serve. Uh, sometimes it just starts, you have to start with the little things. All right, so here's one thing that I've heard also growing up as far as, like I said, ministry in, in the sense of being full-time, like pastor or, or missionary or full-time evangelist, which means different things to different people, but that's a different message. So what, so, something uh, that I've heard growing up was this idea that your, your family is your first ministry is what people always said. And I remember growing up in church, even as a little kid, thinking that just sounds weird to me because it sounds like serving God should be first no matter what. And I struggled with that for a long time. And I went, you know, into Bible college. And of course, I took my family with me. And, uh, and, I, and I, you know, I'm, I'm serving. I'm throwing myself into the ministry, throwing myself into work and all that kind of stuff. And I'm saying, you know, my family's along for the ride. They're kind of with me wherever I go. They don't really have a choice. In the back of my mind, I'm thinking like, well, you know, what would I do if my family started going the other direction? or pushing against me or, or, or not, you know, I'm like, hey, here's what we're going to do. We're going to, you know, we're, okay, here's an example. You know, I mentioned the bus ministry. When I first started working in the bus ministry, I didn't want to. I didn't want to, but, but, and we didn't really have time. And, you know, when we went to, when I first went to Bible college, you had to sign this, uh, these different ministries that you would be interested in doing. Right. And you'd had to just find the different things. And I wrote a list of all these different things that I wanted to do. Guess what wasn't on the list? Bus ministry. That's not something that I wanted to do. And I still remember that we were in a, like a Wednesday night and our pastor had said like three, four weeks in a row. Hey, I want you guys to start praying about this. We really need some people. We've got, we've lost some workers on the bus ministry and we really need some people to step up and take the bus ministry. And I'm thinking, I kind of feel like I should do this, but but I don't really want to. And if I tell my wife, she's going to be like, well, you don't have time for that. But then all of a sudden, I kind of feel her elbow. Dun, dun, dun. And I realize she's wanting to push me to do more for the Lord. She's wanting me to be in the ministry. And I'm like, well, this is great. But in my experience as a pastor and in, in the ministry, what I've seen is, uh, or in lots of different churches and what, what have you, I've seen a lot of cases where this isn't the case. I've seen pastors have to resign. I've seen uh, people who maybe should have resigned to take care of their family, and they didn't, and they ended up their their wife left them, or uh, you know, I've heard some kind of some some really heartbreaking situations. And I thought in my mind, I don't get it. Like I don't know what what is the what is the difference. And I started looking at Bible verses. I remember I was going to preach a message on it, and I'm like, all right, let me see some relationships in the Bible. Like, what are some of our heroes, some men of God that served God, and uh, what was their relationship with their wife? And I looked at Moses. All right, look at Exodus 18. Exodus 18, 
Now, Jethro obviously was uh, Moses' Moses' father-in-law. I guess the verse is going to say that. When Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people, and that the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt, then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her back, and her two sons, of which the name of the one was Gershom, for he said, uh, I have been an alien in the strange land. And the name of the other was Eleazar, uh, for the God of my father said he was mine help and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife unto Moses into the wilderness, where he camped at, Mount, uh, at the Mount of God. And he said unto Moses, I, thy father-in-law Jethro, am come unto thee and thy wife and uh, with uh, and her two sons. And I remember reading that and thinking, Moses gave her, I'm not, I'm not saying anyone should do this, okay? <laughs> but because of the situation, he had to go back to Egypt and the ministry that God had called him to, he sent his wife back. He didn't divorce her. He sent her back to stay with Jethro, her, her father, while he went to the ministry. And he went, when he comes back, Jethro brings her along so he can meet her again. And then it's like, you don't see it. I'm not saying it's not there, but you see like he's talking to Jethro. Oh, you should hear what the Lord did and he did this and that. And I'm looking like, well, what about the wife? You know, shouldn't his first ministry be his wife? And don't get me wrong. There's a lot of godly men in the Bible that had bad relationships with their wives. And I don't think that they should have. <laughs> okay. But that just wasn't a priority to them. And so they uh, it ended up causing problems. How about David? Do we need to mention David and his wives? Uh, that was a bad situation. Okay. Multiple wives for one thing. That's bad enough. And then, uh, and then the way that he seemed to treat them and, and uh, even his friendship with Jonathan, it was like his love for Jonathan was, uh, and don't read any kind of perversion into the scripture, but his love for Jonathan was more than that of women. You know what I mean? Like he, it's like his relationship with women was like, eh, you know, whatever. I need, I, I can't live with them, can't live without them. <laughs> you know, and the, but then, you know, his friends and the, were, the, were the ones who like were, you know, because because Jonathan was a good friend, by the way, godly friend, and encouraged him to do right in the Lord and stuff like that. But his focus was on serving the Lord, and his wife was just kind of like a side thing. And I I look I'm almost offended by that. Like that's not right. There's not not something not right about that. And I'm like, what about Jesus' disciples? And I remember studying that out, and I'm like, all right, Peter. Peter had a wife, right? Well, he had a mother-in-law, but we don't see anything in the Bible about his wife. <laughs> She's there somewhere, but all we see is that he goes to the house of his of his mother-in-law. And one thing I know for sure, you don't have a mother-in-law if you don't have a wife. <laughs> Amen. I love my mother-in-law. <laughs> but anyway, he, uh, uh, and I'm like, what? where are they? And then you see the disciples, all, almost all the disciples, I think, had wives. From just comparing scripture to scripture, it seems like all of them had wives. Where are they? You don't see them in the... You don't see them in the Bible. Uh, very, very little about it. it mentions them, you know, but you don't really see, uh, not by name, it mentions, you know, that they had wives and you don't see anything about them. And I, and I remember just kind of being puzzled by that when I'm in Bible college thinking, like, what do I have to do? Am I doing something wrong? I mean, shouldn't my family be my first ministry? And then one day I was reading and I came across, I mean, I had already read it before, but with this in mind, I came across Aquila and Priscilla. And it was like, oh, finally, I see a couple working together, serving the Lord together with their whole house. And I come across this, this uh, verse about Stephanus and the household of Stephanus. And I'm like, hey, that whole family, and there's lots of places in the Bible where it said, and his house, right? And that whole family was serving the Lord together and they were following the, uh, the head of the house and they were doing everything they could to, uh, to serve the Lord. Look at our, our text right there where uh, he read 1 Corinthians 16. It mentions both of these people. Look at verse 19. Or I should say verse 15. I beseech you, brethren, you know the house of Stephanus that is the first fruits of Achaia, which means uh, when he went into Achaia, uh, Achaia to preach the gospel, these were the first, this was the first family that he was able to reach that got saved. That's why I understand this first. And so, you know, he went back and he discipled them and he, and he spent some time with them and they were very special in his heart. But they went on and it says, and they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints, that, meaning they purposed you know, they made it a habit. They made it an addiction. Uh, you know, I, I was watching something. Uh, of course, I'm getting back into running, and it's not hard for me to understand how if you stick with it, you know, you'll enjoy it. Any kind of workout or whatever, you stick with it long enough, you'll enjoy it. And I saw this video where this guy decided he had never run before, but he wanted to get into shape, and he, so he ran. I don't think it was actually 30 days in a row, but he, he ran like 
you know, he's going to chart out his progress for 30 runs. And he ended up running 30 runs, and somewhere around 25 or something like that, he discovers the runner's high. And, and next thing you know, he's done with this 30 days, and he's like, you know what? I think I'm going to keep on being a runner because it feels good. He didn't feel that way for day one through 10. He had to get out there every morning. The alarm goes off like, oh, man. He had to make himself go do it. He addicted himself to running. Well, in the ministry, it could be the same thing. We got to make ourselves go. We got to make ourselves get up. We got to make ourselves, you know, get our resources together and call the people we need to call and, and all those kinds of things. And then after we're done, and how many of us have experienced this on, on soul winning? It's like so much going on. We got to prepare for this. We got this going on. And there's not really that. I know I personally feel guilty sometimes that I don't just have that desire. Let's go soul winning, you know. Jack Howells wrote a book, Let's Go Soul Winning. <laughs> sometimes I don't feel like that. I'm just like, well, we got to go soul winning. I mean, honestly, I just feel like that sometimes. But then after we're done, you're just like, man, aren't you so glad that we went? Why, did, you know, why didn't I just want to go do that? Why didn't I have a, a great you know, just desire to do it? Because you got to addict yourself to it. And I remember thinking about that one time. Like, If you think about that, any good habit is that way. If you're going to form a good habit, you're going to have to addict yourself to it. Every bad habit, you could pick it up just like that, and it's hard to quit, <laughs> you know what I mean? But the good habits is something that you're going to have to work at and addict yourself to it, and then it's worth it. It's good for you, and, and it's good. Well, the ministry is that way. And uh, Stephanus in the, his household, they addicted themselves to the ministry. Verse 19, the churches of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. And so this is another couple that we see in the book of Acts that Paul uh, links up with, and, and he's in the same trade. He makes tents, and they make tents, and, and, uh, and they end up serving the Lord together. And here's an interesting thing about uh, Aquila and Priscilla. Every single time they're mentioned in the Bible, they're together as a couple. Unlike all the other examples that I found when I was looking for that, when you get to Aquila and Priscilla, every time they're mentioned, they're together. Let's look at it real quickly. It doesn't take long. Acts uh, let me see, verse eight, uh, Acts chapter 18. Acts 18, look at verse 26. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. So you have a couple there, Aquila and Priscilla, and they, are, they meet this man named Apollos, and they sit down and they talk to him, and it says they expound unto him the way of God more perfectly. I love when my wife and I sit down and, and, and counsel with somebody, uh, uh, you know, depending on the situation, I'll have her there with me and we'll counsel somebody. And sometimes, especially if it's a lady, uh, it'll just be like a tag team. You know what I mean? I'll stop. And what do you think about that? And she'll go on for a little while and it's like, hey, we're ministering to this person together. And what a blessing to the person being ministered to, I would think that you got a husband and a wife that are just like there, they're, they're, I remember knocking, I remember preaching the gospel to someone at the door one time and they looked at my wife and said, well, let's see, I, I can't remember how they said that, but they were like, I can tell you love him. I see the way that you're looking at him whenever he's talking. She's like, later on, she's like, I was just, I was just listening to you preach the gospel, but this person, it was so foreign for them to see a couple doing a job together and standing at the door together and, and, uh, and just that meant something to them. And, 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 and they mentioned it to us. And I thought that that was really cool. I feel like that's the case with Aquila and Priscilla. All right. Chapter 18, look at verse two. This is the first mention of them. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila born in Pontus lately come of, a, of a, a Italy with his wife, Priscilla because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart to, from Rome and came upon them. Look at verse 18. And Paul, after he tarried there yet a good while, and then took his leave of the brethren and sailed thence into Syria and with Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head in Sincrea, uh, for uh, he had a vow. Okay, look at verse 26. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogues, whom when Aquila and Priscilla, I already mentioned this one, had heard, they took unto him and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. Uh, Romans chapter 16, a little bit farther to the right. Romans chapter 16 and verse 3. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus. 
First Corinthians, uh, let's see, we already read that one. Uh, 2 Timothy 4. These are all the mentions of either of these names, and they're always together. 2 Timothy 4, verse 19. Salute Priscilla and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. And so, uh, anyway, so we see there that these are always together. See the household of Stephanus. We see all these different people. And, and you think, okay, a whole family can serve the Lord. In fact, I would say they should. That would be the most ideal situation. You know, now there's different situations that come up. There are some cases I've met people who are gung-ho on soul winning, gung-ho on serving the Lord, and their spouse just isn't there yet. And the Bible actually deals with that. There are cases where there's even unbelievers. Somehow one person gets saved and the, the spouse isn't, they're just not, not they're not going to go that, that direction. And so the Bible gives commands for them how to work together. But look, there's sometimes where you got to do as much as you can for the Lord and the spouse might not be with you. But what a great situation. Much better if you can all serve the Lord as a family. And uh, man, you can sure get a lot more done. And some of us are more needy of our spouses than others. <laughs> you know how lost I would be if it wasn't for my wife? I, I probably wouldn't have found my way here today if it wasn't for my wife saying, turn here. <clears throat> okay, that's not true. I know my way here. But uh, seriously, she is the help God has given for me. And uh, I don't know that I could be in the ministry without her, which is why one of the qualifications of a pastor is that he'd be the husband of one wife having his children in subjection over him. And look, when we work together as a family, we get a lot done. Somebody says, well, what do you think they're, you know, they would still be qualified if their wife passed away? Anybody ever heard that question? Like it's an interesting scenario. I've heard of pastors whose wife died and they still remain pastor for a while. But I'm like, you don't only have to ask me twice. Like I would resign immediately because I'm not, I'm not emotionally ready for one thing if I don't have my wife with me. And then she's a, you know, a big, I would still serve the Lord. But, hey, let somebody else be the pastor at that point is what it would be my, for me personally. Okay, but I believe everybody has a ministry, uh, has the ability and even a calling to serve God at a certain, in a certain ministry in their church. And as I mentioned, some people's work schedules are different than others. There are some cases where a person just literally can't do as much as another person. You know, and that's that's okay. Single people, the Bible talks about this. They should be able to do more, right? Because they have a little bit more time. They have they don't have the responsibilities of taking care of a spouse and a family and all that. And uh, in, in different situations for everybody, you know, sometimes uh, you know there's single mom situations that are tough where the mom has to work and be the mom and do all these kinds of things. And we understand there there are limitations on different people, but. We need to search our own hearts and say, what can, how can God use us and what can we do to minister uh, for our church? Now here uh, at this church, we try to encourage everybody to do the work of an evangelist. Okay. Now I do believe that there is a special gift given to some people uh, in this area. You know, a gift of evangelism where they, you know, they just have the heart and the mind of a missionary and they, they actually, you know, maybe they do have a little bit more uh, of a desire, you know, like they just see somebody, ooh, I got to give them the gospel. Now, we all should be training ourselves to be like that because that's the most important thing in the world, right? Giving somebody the gospel and you know, seeing them get saved. But some people, I think they just have an ability and they have an ability to, to relate with people and to sit down and talk to them and, and all that. Look at Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4, let's look at verse 11. <clears throat> and Paul's talking about how Jesus came down and, and, and he's going to talk about what he left, his, left the church with. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, Till we all come in the unity of the, of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So Hebrews 6 says we should, lead, we should go on unto perfection, right? 
We should, uh, we should, we should strive not only to be saved. Glad we're saved. You know, praise the Lord, we're saved. Nothing we can do to lose our salvation, sealed until the day of redemption. But now we need to, in our Christian life, go on unto perfection. Now, none of us are going to be perfect and without sin. We understand that. But go on to be more mature. Go on to be, you know, work towards perfection, if nothing else, and, and try to be like Christ. And the way that we're going to do that is by, number one, not forsaking our, the assembling of ourselves together, uh, like Hebrews 10, 25 says. So we've got to come together as God's people and be assembled. That's the basic. That's the elementary. We've got to be here for encouraging one another and also... Uh, so that we can learn and grow and be encouraged by others. But number two, uh, we not only want to show up, but then we want to also learn how to evangelize and learn how to, uh, uh, to do some of the things that he's talking about in here. Now, the Bible talks about the gift that we should all covet after, right? So coveting in itself isn't bad. If I said I covet your prayers, that's not bad. Uh, we should, there are certain things that we should covet, we should want or desire. And the Bible says that we all should covet to prophesy, to prophesy. Now, don't freak out. I'm not going uh, charismatic on you. <laughs> what does prophesy mean? Well, there was a time before the Bible was written where God's, uh, is God's revelation to man happen in a supernatural way. I mean, the Bible is supernatural. This is a supernatural revelation. But he imparted knowledge to people and, and spoke to them. Sometimes stuff would come out of their mouth and they didn't really have control over it because God had put it in their mind, in their heart to say, all right? We're not under that anymore. I don't believe that we are, okay? I, 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 I definitely don't. I believe, and the Bible talks about that, we have a more sure word of prophecy in God's completed uh, word. And so the... Uh, the gift of prophecy today would be hearing from God through the reading of His Word and the speaking of the, uh, through uh, the Holy Spirit into their heart and the ability to be able to tell people what this says. Okay, It's kind of like teaching, but prophecy would have more expounding on what the Bible says and to be able to do that. This is what we all should covet. What is what, uh, you know, I want to be able to do a lot for the Lord, but the one thing I want to be able to do the most is to be able to understand this Word, have God speak to my heart, and be able to share it with other people. All right, and we do that. We try to encourage everybody to learn to do that through evangelism. Go take the Word of God to people and show them how to get saved. Uh, but then for some, it'll go beyond that, and you'll be able to exhort people and, uh, and help them to know the, what the Bible says in other areas of their life. Okay, look at 1 Corinthians 12. First Corinthians 12. <clears throat> Verse 28, and God has said, God has set some in the church, first apostles. Now there's no apostles anymore. Paul said he was the last, uh, least of the apostles. And, and I believe that he was the last, the final apostle, those who had actually seen Christ. You can look at 1 Corinthians 15. And, uh, and these who had seen Christ and these who had kind of started this whole uh, uh, deal, they were God's chosen you know, 12, and then there was, were the 70, and there were some others uh, that you could call apostles, but, uh, but this was a special thing that we don't really have anymore. Secondary, secondarily, prophets, like I said, we don't have prophets the way that they did before the Word of God was written, but it's still a, uh, uh, it could be something that is a gift if you're thinking about this, which is thirdly, teachers, okay? And then after that, miracles. Now, I don't believe that's something that we're doing today either. Now, there's miracles that happen all the time. And I believe that, uh, you know, when we pray and ask somebody to be healed, you know, ask to get somebody through a situation or whatever, if we didn't believe in miracles, we'd be wasting our time praying, right? <laughs> so we do believe that miracles happen. But those sign miracles, like if you go into a charismatic church and they'll talk about the gifts, uh, spiritual gifts and sign miracles and stuff, and they're talking about some weird stuff like speaking in tongues and gibberish and, and, uh, and not making any sense or, or laying their hands on somebody's forehead and they, you know, they are healed of an infirmity or whatever. I don't believe we have any of those apostolic signs anymore. They're not necessary. Okay, and uh, and I always say this for those who don't uh, who are still kind of confused by that. Well, why would they cease? Well, or what would be the evidence that they cease? To me, the strongest evidence, besides the fact that I just don't personally see them, but that's not that wouldn't be a great answer. The greatest evidence that I have in the Bible why I don't believe there's any of those sign miracles anymore is because 
we literally hear in the Bible that there are going to be deceivers and false prophets in the last day who do signs and miracles. So, like, why would I, if I saw somebody do a miracle, how would that strengthen my faith anymore, right? My faith doesn't come by sight anyway. It should just come by, you know, believing God's Word. And if I see somebody doing a miracle, what I would be more inclined to believe is be like, whoa, the Bible warns us that there are going to be some people deceiving through signs and wonders. And, like, I might have to be leery of this person, all right? So when we had a guy come into, Iola, uh, uh, into our church in Iola on a Wednesday night, and he sat down and he was real quiet, kept to himself. I was a little cautious. I was assistant pastor at the time, but I was watching, make sure he didn't have a bag or something. He was going to pull something out. And, you know, I'm going through all these scenarios in my head. I'm watching him the whole time. And at the very end of the, end of the uh, sermon, our pastor used to do uh, altar calls. And, and he did an altar call. Uh, at the, was, all right, so I'm... I mean, you got like just a handful of people and they're all saved, but you get an altar call. And so then this guy like just gets up and he comes down and we're thinking, whoa, you know, this is great. He's going to come forward and get saved. So he comes forward and, uh, and the pastor's going to go down there and he's going to say, hey, what, what, you know, why are you coming forward? And he gets to the front and he turns around and he looks at the congregation. And he says, God sent me here and he told me that somebody here has a back problem and, uh, and he sent me to heal them. And the pastor looks at me and he's kind of like, get him out of here. <laughs> so I take him and I walk him out and I'm like, hey, man, I don't know if you, you know, if you really believe this. I mean, that's your own business, but we don't believe in that there. We don't teach it. And I took him outside and, and uh, you've heard this story before. The thing that sealed it for me that he was a fraud, not that I didn't know that anyway. So that he was a fraud as he said, well, you watch one day I'm going to be on TV. You, you look for me. He told me his name. He's like, I'm going to be on TV one day. And it's like, that's all he wants. He wants recognition. And so like if he could have put his hand on somebody and prayed for him, and then maybe just by coincidence, they got healed, you know, in a week or something like that. He could have been like, see, did you see my power? Well, the Bible says, the Bible says that's wicked. <laughs> you shouldn't want power just so you can be seen of men and, and all that stuff. But anyway, so I kind of got off on that. But as you look through some of these gifts that were going on in Paul's days, you know, you're like, oh man, maybe I should you know, have the gift of healing. Maybe I should have the gift of miracles. Maybe I should have. And Paul's like, no, you know what? What you ought to covet is prophecy. And then in fact, he's going to say some of these things are going to cease. And he's going to say also that, hey, it doesn't matter what gifts you have if you don't have charity. Like charity is the number one thing. And, and he talks about that in chapter 13. So, uh, but let me go on. Let me see where did I leave off. Verse, uh, let me see here. Think. All right, let me let me look at my passage again. First Corinthians twelve, verse twenty-eight. And God has set some in the church: first apostles, secondary prophets, thirdly teachers. After that, miracles. Look at this. Then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Now you got to think about that. Never meant this angelic just jibber jabber and then like it, it never meant that diversity of tongues is what we still have today we go out and we're, we're talking to somebody and this person speaks spanish and this person speaks uh you know uh, some other language and and uh and, and, and there are people that have a gift of learning languages you know or, or god has put them in a situation where they they are bilingual or languages or whatever people to help us, uh, you know, with, with giving the gospel to Spanish speaking people. And, and, uh, you know, so you get into some neighborhoods that are Asian, you know, most, a lot of Mandarin or something like that. It'd be great to have somebody to go with you who can speak these languages and help, uh, uh Swahili. Well, that'd be nice to have somebody Swahili go over to little Congo and uh, preach the gospel in Swahili. Uh, see, w there are some people that have that ability and, uh, and then helps, a lot of people, you got to able, if you're an able body, you can be a help, you know, you can do, it might not be the most rewarding thing. I mean, I don't want to embarrass anyone, put anybody in the spot, but got a call Saturday uh, and somebody called and said, Hey, we're at the church. We're going to do some cleaning. And they're asking where the key was and where different things up. I'm like, praise the Lord. You know, that's, that's what we need. Somebody to step up and do that. Somebody to take care of a little kind of menial things that you really don't really think as a huge, a huge deal, but they are, they are. You know, the, 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 I don't know where these roaches are coming from, but we keep finding roaches and, and they're dead. <laughs> Everybody's lifting their feet up now. <laughs> Somebody's got to clean those up. Somebody's got to, uh, you know, uh, at least give suggestions or help find somebody who can, uh, who can bait 
that and, and get rid of those. And, and there's little things that, you know, maybe that's somebody's gift. That's somebody's area of expertise, you know, where they, uh, you know, might not be a huge thing. I had a, I had a cleaning business in Oklahoma City. I still kind of do, I guess, in a way. But I had a cleaning business in Oklahoma City uh, for several years. And so it was just when we'd go to a, a, a dinner or something like that afterwards, man, I'd grab the vacuum and I'd grab the different things because my mindset, my ability to do that. Now, I could have been like, man, I have skills that are much, you know, more suited towards preaching the, you know, gospel or, or you know, expounding something behind the pulpit or whatever. No, what we needed was somebody just straighten songbooks. What we needed was somebody just clean toilets. What we needed, you know what I mean? And so you make yourself available and you do what you can. Helps. Governments, people that can uh, deal with administration, you know, people that can do finances, paperwork, all these kinds of things. Uh, eventually, people are called upon to do that. Now, we got a fairly small church that's growing, praise the Lord for that, but we got a, a fairly small church, and so some of these aren't desperate needs right now. And so we're just waiting. We're waiting on the Lord to provide people and give opportunity. And as needs arise, somebody will take that. And, and it's going to work. But, uh, but we all have to consider what is God calling me to do? What is the ministry he's called me to do? And I've kind of uh, taken a lot of time. I haven't really got into uh, some of the main things I was going to talk about as far as what are some uh, kind of ministries going on around here. I've kind of thrown a few ideas out there. But... Uh, but let me just say this. So I, I just put down four categories that I would say, if you're just trying to f see in your heart, like, well, what can I do to be a blessing uh, to the Lord and to the church? Uh, maybe these are some areas that you'd want to get plugged in if you're not already. And a lot, some people will be able to get plugged in more than one area. Okay, so, so here are the basic things that we have going on. Subject, maybe to change a little bit here and there. Again, we don't have anybody on staff that would free them up to be able to work uh, and get a whole lot more done in these areas. But uh, we've got, obviously, the ministry of preaching, teaching, you know, kind of a pulpit ministry. Uh, this is primarily my job, feeding the flock in that way, but also I'm teaching people how to preach. And so there are those who, you know, come for practice preaching and and I kind of do some preaching classes and stuff like that, schedule speakers. If you get the opportunity, if you can, and you want to take part in that and learn how to preach and, and uh, take opportunities to do that. Uh, we got some assignments coming up right now. So I've asked every, everybody who has already been doing some preaching to start gathering some uh, thoughts and prepare some sermons. And so, uh, and so that's one area of ministry. Obviously not for everybody. Ladies, we're not going to call you up here to preach. Behind the <laughs> some people don't, you know, there are some ladies here that would be great preachers. <laughs> My wife can fling her down. I've, I've heard her before uh, in a ladies' meeting. Uh, but she's not going to get up here and preach to guys. That's biblical. Biblical Bible says not to do that. So uh, we wouldn't do that. And so, but th that's a, one of the main ministries of every church is to have a preaching ministry and, uh, and feeding the flock in that way. But there's a lot more to that. There's obviously the outreach ministry. Uh, many of us are involved in that one, but I've kind of called on Brother Justin to kind of head that up and make sure people are taken care of with the maps and they know where they're going. And we mark the map in the back, uh, you know, as we get an area done and uh, just kind of keeping track of the names so that we can go follow up on them. And, and I've kind of delegated that to him. You know, and so he, if you got any questions in that regard, or you want to help in some way, or you want to know how something is going on, get with him. If he doesn't know the answer, he'll come with me. Maybe we haven't thought about something yet. We'll sit down and talk about that. Uh, but that's a good area uh, to get. I mean, I want everybody to get involved. And we're in a uh, very, very fortunate situation to have a church for like 90% or mo probably more than that. Go out there and give the gospel. And, uh, and that's, a, that's a really rare situation, but I praise the Lord for that. Okay, uh, so the, yeah, there's records, contacts, follow-ups, uh, keeping track of all the materials, make sure we have enough and make sure they're purchased and all that. We've got different guys uh, doing that. We've got a, what I would just call the hospitality ministry, which covers a whole lot of stuff. So we're talking about the grounds, you know, taking care of the yard outside and the building. And we've already mentioned cleaning. Uh, you know, some guys have the ability to... Uh, praise the Lord for Brother David and Brother Austin running wires and taking care of. Well, I have no idea how to do all that kind of stuff. And so getting us set up on those things. I've got uh, uh, particularly in this area uh, in the, on keeping up with the building, 
maintenance, uh, supplies, all that. And I haven't given him really specific details, but I got Brother Austin kind of heading that up. I sure appreciate him making sure the lawn's done. I know some guys come out and help with that. And uh, uh, then also with that, I've kind of put him over, in a manner of speaking, over uh, greeters, ushers, uh, and then finances, kind of. We're not there yet, but... Uh, but these are the areas that we need, you know, we need this. These are solid ministries that need to be done. Things that people can, uh, if they got some extra time or some extra energy or abilities, these are ways that they can be a blessing. And then finally, I got Brother David. He heads up, uh, well, he kind of helps out in all areas, but he helps out with the music ministry and the song leading. And then he does uh, media with, the, you know, keeping things online and Internet. And, and then, uh, you know, making sure we got uh, all that lined up and again audio video probably one of my worst thorns in the f- <laughs> in the flesh uh it's not going good our live streaming in iola has been terrible since day one uh but we'll get there brother jeff uh brother josh is helping us out with that in iola and we're going to get there eventually but uh, you see what i'm saying just a lot of different things to do and here's the thing just make serving the lord a priority in your life. I'm not saying it's like you're going to do that with 90% of your time because obviously that's not, I just saw a deer right in our backyard. Uh, Obviously that's not um, feasible. Everybody's got a lot of different things that they have to do. But by priority, I mean it's something that needs to get done. If nothing else gets done, my service to the Lord is going to get done, right? And uh, let's just finish with, this wasn't in my notes, but let's go to Romans 12 and we'll stand and be dismissed. Romans 12, when you think of all God's done for us and the sacrifice that was made through His Son and uh, tasting of death for all of us who was with not, uh, without sin, uh, this verse is just so relevant to us all. Let's all stand. <clears throat> we'll get ready to have the instrumentalists come for a dismissal, but let me read this to you. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. He says, man, just give your life to the Lord. It's your reasonable service, right? It's your reasonable service. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for your word. We love it. And uh, we have faith in, that every, every word in this Bible is your word and, and it's, it's beneficial and profitable for us. And I pray that you'll help us love it more and uh, apply it to our lives and grow in knowledge and wisdom. And I pray that you'll help us to be able to find a way to get plugged in and serve you a little bit more uh, every time that we're able to. And uh, bless, Lord, your church, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.